Uh, this is kind of inside baseball, and I hope that a lot of the people who have been watching the show for the past few months won't even know why this is a big day. Uh, but today we marked 200 shows starting on time. Oh, they'll know. They yeah. know it's a big day. Well, no, but people that have been watching for a long time might not know. They yeah. might be like, yeah, you're supposed to start on time. Which is true, I'll grant you that. <laughs> but we did not. I mean, there was years where we would start 5, 10, 15 minutes late. And it took a monstrous effort with a few restarts where we... You know, oh, there's also on. an asterisk. Which is that Jank Uger wasn't here for 173 of those days. <laughs> that is true. There was a bit of an assist Let's there, but... Um, Jank does slow the process down. A little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we... Look, we, we want you guys to be able to rely on us to be here when we're supposed to be here. And so we've been trying, both us, but more importantly, the people behind the cameras who make sure we're here and uh, broadcasting. And so this marks 200 shows. And so I just want to that. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, we do have a big show. Um, this week has a theme, and that is the fight to stop the AHCA. This show has a theme, and that is uh, the brewing um, corruption, both inside of the Trump family and also in their business associates. And we, so we have a couple of stories we want to do uh, today concerning those. Anything we need to get to before we jump into the stories? Uh, anything you want to talk about? I mean, other than uh, Megan Kelly having Alex Jones on her show. It's just, um, it's just, it's it's just it's obscene. Pathetic. Yeah. It's, I, I just, I get it. I mean, I get why. They say it's they a can, ratings grab. It's a ratings grab. She yeah. needs it apparently. You know, Sunday night on on MSNBC, um, and I don't necessarily think it means an endorsement, but it's Father's Day, right? Oh, oh you're which, right. I didn't. Even, oh, I, 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 I thought it was about. obscene before I remembered it was Father's yeah, Day. Yeah, and, and <laughs> think about not just the, this guy who says Sandy Hook was a hoax, but also the, the fact lying. that that he has all this paternity background to him yeah. and that'd be deadness to him. Uh, he's a clown and uh, and it's too yeah. bad. They probably would get just as much traction by canceling it and and then that would go for that, right? Yeah. No? Yeah. Uh, they may they get it when you say traction, they get impact by canceling him. Yeah. But they wouldn't get tuned in by transit right? right. And he's I mean, that's all they're doing. This is you know, it's kind of good that you mention it because it's a great reminder that when we watch all these different networks, they're only motivated by the dollar. They're only motivated by making a buck. And yeah. that's why they book Alex Jones. So they don't, they get uh, headlines by canceling Alex Jones, but they don't get the tune in and the dollars that they want associated yeah. well, with Well, that's it. true. It, but there's something provocative about it too, right? I mean, isn't he somebody that, that I'm being devil's advocate here. If you're sitting at, at, at NBC, you're saying, hey, we got, a, we got Alex Jones. He's coming on. He's talking to us. I don't know how, tough a get he is, but I mean, he's certainly somebody people talk about, and that interview would get... I assume he was get, enthusiastic. There would be, oh, yeah, there would I don't be think he's a right. get no, I, I, I don't think so, but they, yes. so there's a viral element to it that could happen. And that's what she's hoping show. for. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's not the yeah. only viral... He brings his own viral element. Yeah, it's not, right. It doesn't have to do with clicks. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's pathetic. It's pathetic whether it was her idea or whether MSNBC forced it on her. It doesn't matter. It's pathetic. I mean, she's her defenders are going to say, well, look, she was really hard on him. It doesn't matter. People like that just want you to see their face. They just want to scream at the camera for a few minutes. It doesn't matter if you show point by point how wrong they are. Their mission is accomplished the second the camera starts rolling. And she is smart enough to know that. For all of her own problems, she knows what she's doing, and I don't think that she should be participating in that. Yeah, I agree. they got they got to cancel it. Yeah. Okay, now let's turn to some domestic news. It's incredibly likely that this week will be uh, the beginning of the end for either Obamacare or Trump care. Uh, cloaked in secrecy with effectively no debate whatsoever, Republican senators are working to push through the AHCA uh, as quickly as possible. They're going to advance it, they're going to vote on it, and you will know effectively nothing about what the Senate version of the AHCA is until the vote actually happens, unless we do something to stop that. And so that is going to be the theme on today's show and throughout this week. Now, I want to give a little bit of credit to Claire McCaskill uh, late last week talking with uh, Orrin Hatch over this secrecy. I think that she could have gone a little bit harder, but she is actually bringing up the issue. So let's play this video and then discuss. Will we have a hearing on the health care proposal? Will we? Yes. I, I, I think we've already had one. but No, I mean on the proposal that you're planning to bring to the floor of the Senate for a vote. Will there be a hearing? Well, I don't know that there's going to be.
be another hearing, but we've invited but, you to, to... And you say that you're inviting us, and I heard you, Mr. Secretary, just say we'd love your support. For what? We don't even know. We have no idea what's being proposed. There's a group of guys in a back room somewhere that are making these decisions. There were no hearings in the House. I mean, listen, this is hard to take. Well, you couldn't have a more partisan exercise than what you're, what you're engaged in right now. We're not even going to have a hearing on a bill that impacts one-sixth of our economy. We're not going to have an opportunity to offer a single amendment. It is all being done with an eye to try to get it by with 50 votes and the vice president. I am stunned that that is what Leader McConnell would call regular order, which he sanctimoniously said would be the order of the day when the Republicans took the Senate over. We are now so far from regular order, the new members don't even know what it looks like. And if you're coming up as an American, trying to understand American politics in the past couple of years, I don't think anyone knows what regular order looks like on a, on a wider sense. Um, but yeah, he, I mean, he was fed a line. He asked for someone to tell him what to say there. Um, now, he's not the problem at the end of the day. It's all of them. He's all the problem at the beginning of the day. <laughs> he's the problem at the beginning of the show, certainly. Um, and he is part of the problem. But I love this idea that we already had a hearing. You had a hearing. I don't. First of all, I don't remember that hearing, and I don't believe that there was a hearing. But it wasn't the about this bill. But yeah. But even if they had, had yeah. it, even if he wasn't lying there, mm -hmm. I mean, do you guys remember when they were debating mm -hmm. Obamacare? Mm -hmm. From the beginning of the debating to the bill actually being passed, I think three Fast mm -hmm. and Furious movies came out. That's how long it was. How many hearings there were? How many amendments there were? Just constantly trying to get Republicans to sign on to it. Here he's like, "Well, we already spoke once. Why would we do it again?" So 20 or 30 million Americans are going to lose their health insurance. Maybe 30,000 Americans are going to die unnecessarily uh, every single year. Are we going to talk twice about this? No. And so that's absurd. Now that's their defense, but it, um, we're going to talk a little bit procedurally how they're trying to advance this more quickly. Uh, but we do know that this is not just Orrin Hatch's position, this is the default position of the Republicans in the Senate. They're not going to make this clear until at least after the CBO scores it. Uh, two uh, Senate GOP aides said this, we aren't stupid, we're still in discussions about what will be in the final product, so it is premature to release any draft absent further member conversations and consensus. Members there being Republicans, since the Democrats don't even know what's in the bill. And one of the reasons they're not stupid, I guess, and don't want this to be discussed, is uh, summed up in this poll from Quinnipiac showing the approval rating for the HCA is at 17%, making Donald Trump look like Justin Bieber. That's an old reference. I don't even know if he's that popular anymore. Uh, but it's not popular, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things there. First of all, we, you know, he said we're not stupid because they know exactly what they're doing. They're trying to go the roundabout route with this and get something through without very many people being a part of it. So yeah. that's what they're saying. They're not stupid. We're not stupid politically. Uh, yeah. And that just explains... I mean, implicit in that is that they know exactly what they're doing because they are not stupid and they are going to try and force feed this. The one thing about which to be somewhat encouraged is that there aren't any sort of nationally ambitious or aggressive Republicans uh, on the Senate side who are going to run with this and run as uh, people who think that they're that, that by supporting it, they need to appeal to Republicans and by opposing it, uh, they, they wound themselves. Uh, Bill Cassidy of, of Louisiana is one to watch. And a lot of the moderates have been kind of, you know, a little bit dull on this, a little bit saying, hey, uh, you know, I don't know that we should go ahead with this. And now you see them starting to speak a different language about it. Dean Heller the, of Nevada, you've been to Nevada, Mark. Mm -hmm. Dean Heller, uh, Dean Heller is, uh, is somebody who's up for re-election next year in, a, in a, what is a blue state, and he's a Republican. Uh, he has a lot to do with what happens with this. So coming out of that, I mean, this isn't a done deal, but it's still so discouraging to see the process go in the direction that it's gone on this, because they're not going through regular order, like you said, John, and they are not telling people what's in this bill. You talk about GOP, though, as uh, attaching themselves to this. I mean, there is not a lot of political capital to be gained by being associated with this bill. Right. I mean, the GOP, so uh, I'd be surprised if it you know, it's it should have some ten foot pole marks all over it, because, and, and which it did as recently as last week, yeah. and right now he starts 
interested in hearing people who are moderate. Shelley Moore Capita of West Virginia speaking just kind of, you know, a little bit more carefully. Well, maybe it's a little better than it was. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are those people that are, well, we don't know for sure if they will support it. I mean, it being at 17% and not, I mean, there, there are policies that could theoretically be at 17% approval that they would still pass, but like the war in Iraq. Exactly. Yeah. But particularly salient when the topic that's so unpopular theoretically will strip your own constituents of their health care and leave their families destitute and their uh, uh, businesses bankrupt. Um, I think that will have an effect. And we're going to return to those people in the middle that might be swayed in just a second. But I want to talk again procedurally. How are they working on this? Uh, last week, McConnell deployed Rule 14, a fast track procedure that bypasses the committee process and moves the bill directly to the floor. Just as in the House, we're on track to have a vote with no hearings when there were more than 100 for the ACA. So just in case Orrin Hatch is watching, they didn't have just two, by the way. Uh, knowing the coverage loss will be significant, McConnell plans to vote within only days or possibly even hours of the release of the CBO score. Uh, and before and after the CBO will be discredited by the, by the Republicans as much as possible, possibly shut down. I've heard that uh, bandied about uh, as well. And so they're not even going to bother with the whole committee uh, procedure going through that step. They're going to pass it immediately to the House, or to the floor, I should say. And uh, they're hoping that they get the score, they vote on it, maybe a basketball game is on or something, and they can just slip it through and they don't have to worry anymore. And that could come within the next couple of weeks, theoretically. Yeah, and uh, they also have the White House behind it, too. Mm -hmm. And so the White House doing all of whatever it is they're doing, trying to get some positive news, trying to get, you know, the, the president's been between 34 and 38 percent in approval ratings, not, not just Quinnipiac, which, by the way, you're from Bridgeport, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Quinnipiac is in Hamden, Connecticut. You have to be able to say Quinnipiac better. It's been like seven years of you saying Quinnipiac. I was fairly certain that I was saying it correct. I don't think you were. <laughs> the only direct experience I have with it, other than polling, is that I played a tennis tournament there once. Of course. When you were in yeah. Bridgeport and they were yeah. in Hamden. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, you probably said it wrong then, too. But the point is like that, that these... Um, that. That the White House is looking for, and the Republicans want to change that tide because they need uh, to be able to say something's going on that isn't Russia, that isn't Jared Kushner, that isn't the hearings and the special counsel. And so they need this too. Yeah. The White House is giving them a lot of leeway. They need to show that they can do something. Right now, the story yeah. is look, they've got control of everything and they can't get anything done. Uh, this may be the wrong, I think, clearly you're right. At the end of it all, they just want to say, hey, look, and we've got this passed, you know. We uh, we undid that awful Obamacare. Uh, I just don't know once the dust settles, and and they're keeping it dusty, so it may not settle for a while, right. what we're really going to be left with. I mean, it, that is to say, whether they're going to be left with anything they can be proud of, might be another way to put it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, as a, as a country, we certainly won't be left with anything to be oh, proud no, of. Right. We also, we also, the we things uh, that make them proud, by the way, are not yeah, necessarily yeah, that's a good the, point. The benchmark. Um, yeah, they'll build talking points about what, uh, around whatever comes out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And we're not going to go through all the stats again. We've done it dozens of times over the course of the past year. Um, but I mean, there's there's perhaps other than maybe climate change related issues, or maybe the tax code. I don't know if there's a more consequential thing that the Republicans are going to attempt to do during this first term in terms of the impact on American families' lives, uh, welfare, and their actual wealth as well. I mean, the numbers are stark. If you're talking about the numbers of hundreds of billions of dollars of effective tax giveaways that are going to go to the richest Americans, the number of Americans who are going to lose health insurance, the effect is dire. You already know that. So we're not going to go through it again. Um, but we do want to give you something you can do with this. And it's a fairly old school political thing. But here I do think that it could have some effect. So if we could bring up this lower third here. It's a very simple thing. Uh, I want you to get your phone. We can bring up the lower third. Final grab. So that's the switchboard uh, at the U.S. Capitol where you can uh, talk to, you can try to get to at least the office of your senator. And they are going to have an aide who's working in particular on their health care policy. And you have got to call in and you've got to make yourself heard. Because as uh, Michael was saying, there are some Republican senators who are rightfully horrified about what effect voting for this might have on their electoral prospects the next time around. Some of them are up in just a year and a half. Those people can theoretically be persuaded. And while it seems ridiculous in this time that they would actually care about people calling into their uh, their offices, 
Everything I've read leads me to believe that they do still actually pay attention to that. Well, look, Capitol Hill is trapped. That these guys are back. Uh, they're turning the wayback machine in 1950. Believe me, the phone ringing off the hook matters to these guys. They don't. They don't know of texting. Yes. I mean, really, the guys deciding on this are a bunch of old white guys in Washington. So. Yeah, ring those phones. Yeah, we only have two old white guys on this panel. So that's <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. Give right. some time. Okay, but that is something that you can oh, do, and we will continue to track this uh, throughout this week uh, and let you know uh, to, what they're uh, what they're doing to try to advance this. Uh, but let's turn to something slightly different as soon as I find it. Okay. <clears throat> A day of protests across Russia has turned into a series of mass arrests, uh, beginning with the detainment of a prominent Putin uh, critic named Alexei Navalny. Uh, Navalny's wife, Yulia, said on his Twitter feed that he was arrested about a half hour before the Moscow demonstration uh, that he was going to attend was to begin. Police later confirmed the arrest, saying he could get up to 15 days in jail on charges of failing to follow police orders and violating public order. Well, we now know he didn't get up to 15 days. He got 30 days in jail uh, for some sort of crimes about organizing. So he was one of the, the, the critics of Putin who organized uh, these mass demonstrations across the country. And you will be shocked to find out that if you are a critic of Putin, bad things can happen to you. 30 days in j uh, jail, a fairly light uh, consequence for his activism. Yeah, especially, uh, you know, Navalny is not just a critic of Putin. His his main issue is corruption. It's corruption, yes, specifically, so. and he's very vocal about it. Um, so you're going to go after Putin. Yeah, corruption, that's really hit them, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And you're seeing, what you're seeing there is, is not, uh, not Navalny's arrests, but you're seeing uh, possibly up to a thousand arrests across Russia uh, throughout today. Um, uh, as of early evening, nearly 700 people have been detained in Moscow alone, as many as 900 in St. Petersburg, according to rights groups. Police even admit 650 detentions in just those two cities and smaller numbers of protesters being detained uh, across the country. There were permits for up to 190 separate marches. Um, now, this follows an earlier, uh, back in March, an absolutely massive series of demonstrations against Putin. Uh, now, that had an electoral, uh, electoral component and also a corruption com uh, component as well. Uh, there is going to be elections in the relatively near future uh, in Russia. Putin theoretically could receive an additional six years as the leader of that country, which just boggles the mind. Um, but that is a possibility. And someone like Navalny, um, being uh, one of the opposition figures who hasn't yet been assassinated, uh, says that he is going to stand in that election. And uh, he has been charged with any number of different crimes of embezzlement and and all of these things. He's been sentenced to five years of hard labor before. Thankfully, uh, there was a, an outcry from rights groups, and that was vacated. He was released after being uh, arrested. Um, but this is just another in a long series of detainments and arbitrary arrests. When I was in Oslo, I reported on a, a prominent uh, theater director in uh, Moscow had been arrested, as well as 50 of his associates for breaking some sort of morality code in the arts it's a gigantic mess there, but it is heartening to see so many uh, Russians, especially uh, these sorts of young Russians that fall in Navalny, uh, continuing to protest, even though that scene that you're seeing there, that's not new or surprising to them. They've yeah, I've seen this before. That's a great point, John. I mean, the idea that you're swimming uh, upstream against that kind of current of violence against protesters, and, you know, it's the Wild West out there. The, the cops can do whatever they want. The riot police... Uh, beat up a lot of people, they detain and arrest uh, even more, and you end up with a, a situation that is designed to discourage participation in the system. It's designed to discourage protest. And then John also rightly said, uh, ultimately, the leaders of these movements are eliminated. I mean, literally off the face of the earth. Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a courageous move beyond the normal courage that we see for people to take to the streets of Russia. And they're trying to stop them from even being able to take to the streets, not just what they do to them when they do. They're trying to prevent that organization, which is, um, you know, that's what the, I think, the whoever is the head of police there is saying that they want to prevent it. And 
Kyle, you brought up Oslo and a theater director. Did you know that the play Oslo won the Tony Award for Best Play last night? So I so did not know that. Comes full circle. Yeah. Yeah. Small yeah. world. Surprising. Um, but yeah, and look, uh, Navalny uh, in April of this year was ambushed on the street and had uh, this substance thrown into his face that dyed his face. Um, thankfully, it, it did not kill him. He apparently has lost uh, the vast majority of his sight in his right eye. Uh, but that is, th this is the danger in standing up to a regime like Putin's, is that theoretically that could just be the beginning. Um, I, I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of the, uh, the opposition figure who was uh, poisoned and nearly killed several years ago, was poisoned again, I believe, in the, in the last year. Oh, again, uh, Yushchenko. Uh, 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 Victor, Victor Yushchenko, Yushchenko yes. Yushchenko. Um, so he spoke in Oslo while I was there and has twice uh, attempted assassinations against him. They also had the daughter of Boris Nemtsov, who was gunned down uh, outside of, uh, of the government building in, uh, in, in Moscow. I mean, this is an incredibly dangerous thing for regular people attempting to exercise their, their uh, political rights and for those who will stand as leaders for that movement. Um, I hope that they release as many of these people as possible. I don't think that this is, if this is an attempt to shut down the protest, to try to cut, to hamstring uh, the movement, it doesn't seem likely to work considering uh, the, the sorts of people we saw in that video. Anyway, uh, we do have to take our first break. When we come back, we're going to turn back to America and back to uh, the corruption that's taking over our government. Uh, Trump uh, personally enriching himself and his business associates. We're going to break that down when we come back from this break. I'm super excited because we have different levels of members. They pay $10 a month, um, but there are some members that pay a little more, executive producers, for instance. My favorite thing about executive producers is that we have quarterly calls with them. I love that I'm getting a little transparency and I'm knowing what you guys like and dislike. Ideas on how to improve the show, topics that maybe we haven't heard of yet and really want us to cover. We have so much respect for you because of the fact that you keep us independent and allow us to be uncensored, unfiltered, without worrying about corporate sponsors breathing down our necks and telling us what we can and can't say. So if you want to be a member, obviously no pressure. Uh, you can go ahead and join by going to tytnetwork.com slash join. I'm going to ask some uncomfortable questions. The first topic that I said that we would discuss a little more uh, is masturbation. And then I was swimming in a hazelnut river. Are you sure you're not doing mushrooms? Oh my God, I can achieve an orgasm by myself. Fuck that, I am going to talk about it because there should be no shame on it. I think a lot about that because I, I love life. That openness led to amazing. And I keep saying to everybody, oh, I got to go call my wife. I figured that that was a good excuse that people can't say, hey, don't call your wife. I'm going to release it. It's so weird because at that moment I felt good and it smelled like lavender. At the end, you get to go check. Nice job. If you're a member of the young person, you know a rock tour. Hey, Jenny, what's up? Aaron, did they change the icon for Vine? I can't find it. We talk about TYT Army being so strong. Usually they help us run our show. Now they're going to help us run the country. Oh, yeah. like this. It's time that we reclaim democracy for the people. <laughs> We had a huge victory for Wolfpack. When Lincoln said this was a country by, of, and for, he said of the people, not of corporations. Our representatives don't represent us. Oh, democracy! We are! We are! Too strong! There's thousands of volunteers, and you can be among them. So with Wolfpack, the mission is so clear. Money is killing our democracy.
<laughs> anyway, uh, so we are back on the Young Turks. Welcome uh, to uh, the rest of the first hour with me, John. Uh, Michael Shores here, Mark Thompson as well. Jank is still out. I have no idea what country he's in. I'm going to keep it real. Uh, but we do have I know what country he's in. No, where is he? What are you about to say? Yeah, uh, probably the best film. So let's not say. Okay, let's not do it. It's a country. We're going and to... Uh, Jank. Okay. We're going to poll you guys. It's a game of uh, where in the world is Jank Uger. Uh, but anyway, we're going to read some tweets that you sent in. Uh, Peter Giel wrote, Man, I didn't expect you to start on time. Missed the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's that's a long time, TYT viewer. I don't think uh, it's that's, that's a 201 yeah. day old tweet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, let's Great see. Uh, referring back to the uh, Trump Care story, Dr. Chaos MD, who has my favorite name, if your aide has to spoon feed you your entire response to a simple question and you can't even say that, time to retire. <laughs> yes. Uh, you have to work extra hard to make uh, John McCain look with it. <laughs> who said um, that? No, I just didn't. That's oh, that you my, said that? My observation. Oh, wow. Um, fourth, by the way, Warren Hatch, fourth in line for the presidency. I love oh, it. I got it. He, he, God, if if something job. happened to Pence and Ryan and our president, uh, our president would be Warren Hatch. Wow. Uh, yes, so thank you uh, for those tweets. I want to recognize uh, the members. It looks like it has been updated. Uh, two of the members, Roberto Ivan. And William Mazuka, thank you uh, for being members and uh, supporting us. And uh, let's talk about uh, something that members can see. Actually, over the past uh, weekend, TYT attended the People's Summit in Chicago, and we have an exclusive look into the conference available for TYT members only on the website, uh, tytnetwork.com. Uh, so those two members can already see it. If you're not a member, you can fix that by going to tytnetwork.com slash join, signing up, and you'll have access to that. Tell us what the People's Summit is, John. So the People's Summit was, uh, I would say, an opportunity to once again hear Bernie Sanders give an awesome uh, hour-long speech. But it was also, it was a gathering of up-and-coming politicians, activists, enthusiasts, and all that from around the country. Excellent. Yeah, just awesome. watch it. And so we released tons of videos from it already, but this uh, we also have this uh, extra uh, for the members, so that's something to uh, to look forward to. But let's uh, let's move on to the next story. Last week in D.C., it was Infrastructure Week. Not really, but they wanted it to be. It was really Comey Week. I don't think they got that memo. Comey was talking about the whole thing. Exactly. Something about pipes. Uh, but no, Trump wanted it to be Infrastructure Week. He had his plan for infrastructure, and so. The way things normally go on TYT, I would go through that plan and I'd make a bunch of graphics, breaking down all the specifics, the stats, the quotes, and all that. Uh, I can't actually do that because there is no plan. There are no details. And despite the fact that they wanted a whole week to be named after this, we know almost nothing. At least with Shark Week, there's multiple shows you can watch. They actually have something. Um, we only know one thing about his plan, but even just that is enough to know uh, what their goal here is. Yeah, that it's going to so, be the best plan ever? It's going yeah, to yeah. be the best plan ever. I have two things then. Okay. That's true. Uh, but Robert Reich had an awesome breakdown of this. Uh, one of the interesting details, it would commit $200 billion of federal uh, uh, funding over 10 years, but more importantly, it would be combined with about $800 billion of assorted tax breaks to get developers to build things instead of the federal government doing it. That's weird. A president who is a supposedly, presumably wealthy developer is going to get projects for developers. That's oh, just weird. Yeah. By the way, stuff. just as an aside, all those roads and bridges that you've seen that really were in pretty good shape when they were first built, but now have kind of fallen into disrepair, they were built by the government. The government. Yeah. 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 So it's not as though I know we go, well, the government will screw it up. Well, uh, we have one of the best uh, highway systems uh, in the world, and it was built by the government, and it gave a lot of people jobs. So yeah. they're going to get up ahead of ourselves. Yeah, look, that was all well and good, but let's give Eric Trump a chance and see what he can build. Yeah. Um, so that that is the goal there. So for every dollar developers put into a project, uh, they'd actually pay only about 18 cents after tax credits. Taxpayers would contribute uh, about 82 cents through their tax dollars. Now, look, our case could be made there that theoretically, if the government was doing it themselves, taxpayers would be paying for that too, right? And so you might say, well, what's the difference if you pay the government or you pay uh, the developers? Well, there is a big difference because the way they're going to do it, the public would actually pay a second time as well. The developers would, in the end, own the roads and bridges and other pieces of infrastructure they finance. They then, of course, charge members of the public tolls and fees 
to use them. So rather than all of us contributing as a country, as a society, and then benefiting from those roads and bridges and pipes and all of that, we would instead subsidize private contractors to build and then own and then fine and toll your ass off into the rest of time. I'm sure there'd be an open and transparent bidding process to who gets those, uh, yeah. who gets the gig to rebuild the bridge and the mm. road, like there are when governments and, and departments of transportation on a state by state basis put them out right now to bid. Uh, it's a disaster. This is a scam. This is entirely, um, untenable. Uh, I, I, the notion that they would then be responsible for and own these structures is so contrary to the way it ever worked. Yeah. And, and it should. And but it's so consistent with this whole Trump administration, the fact that the selling of America, has, which we've always seen on some level, but it's sort of so naked now, right? He's really selling these projects to his buddies, to his, his billionaire contractor pals. And as you see them leasing public lands for mineral exploits and for petroleum yeah. drilling, that's the same thing. It's the selling of America. But also where it's not broken, right? I mean, that's the other part. What you just, you know, going off what you just said, Mark, we've been driving over these bridges and going through these tunnels and roads up for, you know, decades yeah. and decades and decades. And guess what? They're breaking down, not because of how they were made. They were made really, really well, right? So that's what you do again, and that's the way it works. And so privatizing it is only going to get, and look, I mean, you say privatizing, look at, the air traffic control. Air safety in America is extraordinarily good, right? Uh, U.S. Uh, you know, uh, commercial air ca traffic is is unbelievable the way they work. Now Trump wants to privatize it. There are problems with it, but this guy thinks that the problem is only solved by getting someone else rich and by privatizing an industry. That's what he wants to do with infrastructure. He wants to do with the air with the air traffic controllers. It's a reflex. It's a knee jerk reaction. Yeah, uh, and, and just as an aside. Uh, the maintenance of the roads, which is really what we need. A lot of this stuff just needs sort of uh, uh, something that's it's deferred maintenance is what's happened. Do it with uh, private prisoners. They they don't. Uh, there's not enough as much money in that. They want. They're going to want to build new roads. They're going to. They, they're new construction is where the money is for these yeah. guys. So it doesn't even address the real needs of this country. Yeah, and look, maybe there are some places where theoretically they could do some sort of major development, like an area. Like I know Austin's highway system absolutely sucks. It, it cannot uh, accommodate the number of people there. So theoretically, maybe you need some additional roads or something like that. But a lot of these bridges and roads, like you say, just need to be maintained. But if you have a private contractor do it, then they can spend a little bit of money. It's already built, okay? The vast majority of the work is already done, except that they get to turn it over to a toll road. And we've had this problem for a while in America where, look, some states and local governments desperately need money. And so they, you know, they bond out these roads and stuff like that. They give them these 50, 100 year leases on these private roads. But a lot of times it's just short-sighted or it's local or state-level corruption. But it's been haphazard and slow. This takes out all – you can just – in one fell swoop, you can do that to the entire country. Have you lived in an area where a road has been converted over to tolls? It's horrible, especially in California where you don't even actually pay. You have to remember to go on a website and pay right. later on. Which is absolutely horrendous. Um, that's a tangent, perhaps. No, it's uh, not a tangent. Is, that's that's accurate because who's getting the penalty money? Who's exactly. getting? You know, yeah, they so want you to forget, exactly. so they can charge you even more. So it's not a tangent at all. It's part of the same kind of scam that everybody's falling for. And if if production and 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 you know, productivity, not production, is one of the aims of America, right? To moving America forward, making it great again. Uh, what does this do? It sends the rich people on the roads, or the people that want to pay to get out of it, not just rich people. On the toll roads, and then the the traffic is is complicated down on all other roads. Yeah. So the expeditious moving from point A to point B is harm, but people are making money. It sounds like a, a sort of a basic argument, but it's actually true. It, it it was borne out here in California that the traffic increased on the roads that didn't have the tolls, where they thought it was going to separate it and make people move move yeah. faster. It's not. It's a bad bad thing. Yeah, and so I'm glad that you brought up the the class component because of course we can't miss that uh, if you have have just raw tax money paid for the maintenance, then theoretically a person who's paying a lot more in taxes is paying a greater uh, absolute amount of money. But if you instead subsidize it by each individual human paying every time they use this, then that's inherently regressive. And the people who, the, the huge amount of poor or middle class Americans who have to use those roads every day 
just to get to work and home, they are going to be paying a larger percentage of their income than having the rich contribute in the way we've always uh, expected in America's past. Okay, let's turn to, uh, there we have the, the, the wide uh, swath of uh, corruption. We want to look at one uh, particular example of what we were just talking about. More infrastructure. A little bit more infrastructure. The FBI is currently looking for uh, to, to build a new headquarters and a campus in D.C. And uh, the FBI is gigantic. It has a lot, thousands of employees that are going to be there. So this is a big development. It's expected that it's going to be one of the biggest building-related uh, government contracts in U.S. history, estimated to start off with a price tag of $2 billion. We know how these things work out after a few years or after a decade, not to mention, of course, running the thing. And the contractor who's going to build the new one gets to control the previous one, which is an amazingly valuable piece of real estate. So who gets this contract is incredibly important, very lucrative. So let's check in on who might get this. Here's a surprise for you. Vornado Realty Trust, a New York real estate firm whose founder and chairman, Stephen Roth, is a longtime friend of and occasional advisor to Donald Trump, is one of three finalists for the rights to develop the FBI's new headquarters uh, and uh, campus. Now, you might have seen him in the news recently. Roth is uh, helping head up Trump's infrastructure, infrastructure Advisory Council, from which we have so many details, and traveled with the president as he rolled out his plans last week. Trump introduced him to the crowd as one of the greatest builders in America. I don't know if that's true, but he might soon be one of the richest builders in America if Donald Trump, whose administration will be making this choice, decides to go with him. Is, is there any president who is more deserving of, of, of overseeing the groundbreaking of a new FBI headquarters? <laughs> I, can't think of, I can't think of who that would be. Uh, it is Stephen Roth already one of the built biggest ever? Yeah, I mean, richest builders in America, mm -hmm. uh, as we as we speak. Uh, Crew, the uh, Center for Research uh, for uh, what is it, uh, uh, ethics and politics, responsible ethics, ethics watchdog, in, yeah. in Washington, the ethics watchdog has said that there's no chance that this would pass any kind of muster. Mm -hmm. That having Roth win this bid, and I think, I mean, well, of course, he'll win it, right? But uh, <laughs> you would think that um, that what Crew is having to say about it, that the, the president would not want to run up against Congress again on something as, as Ball faced is this, and that's what, what it is. I just don't Assuming know. that there would be a run up. Thank you. I would well, just right. don't know that you would get, get pushback. Or well, well, I think that I, I, I think you're right. I mean, there's nothing I, you can't know that he would get pushback. But the more these, these things do have a cumulative effect, they had them on Nixon in a, in a malignant way, they had them on Carter in a benign way. So the way that these things, if you keep presenting Congress with things that they are just against, and you get people in your own party starting to become against them, yeah. and you run into it, it's probably not going to happen with Joe Roth and Fornado, Steve Roth and Fornado. But if they're the kind of things that add on to the, the sort of the, what is the game where you put Jenga pile? Yeah. Uh, and and I, think, um, I think that's problematic. But this is problematic on another level, because you're going to be in court again on something like this. And he, they don't care. Obviously, they don't care. They're there to get their cronies wealthy, yeah. and and that's uh, going to their wealthy cronies wealthy. By the yeah, right. People are already well wealthy. Yeah, yeah. Wealthy. yeah. yeah and uh, so I mean, look, we were just talking about the possible eight hundred billion dollars that's going to be just given out to all these different contractors. I mean, that's obviously a much larger sum of money, but. There's something personal about this, about that he can simply say, oh, my buddy gets this, that I think for a lot of Americans is going to be more clearly corrupt. Like everybody gets when your friend gets two billion dollars. I mean, not that we have the personal experience, but we know that just that sounds like Russia. It sounds like Turkey. It sounds like some third world country that we don't want to be. And I, I hope that a lot of Americans have a problem with this. But John, so just I want to, to, to play off of what you just said. I know you, there's another thing you want to say, but what you said is so true. I mean, that's exactly what's going on here. And that's exactly what's at the center of this Russia investigation, right? It's people thinking, perhaps rightfully, we don't know yet, Bob Mueller hopefully is going to figure this out, that the reason that all of this is happening was to get his cronies richer, that, that he yeah. was going to lift these sanctions in exchange for lifting these sanctions. Wealthy Russians were going to come in, invest. They were, going to, they were going to relax the debt that they had. All of that was going to happen. So this is similar to that. I mean, this is exactly what's going on here. Let's get Steve Roth rich, just like we're going to get X. A Y and Z Russian red. Yeah, it's, it's truly Putin esque. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely That's what uh, what John said. I mean, it is. It's a. It's a. It's Russia two point oh.
Yeah. Now, just in case, like, you think, okay, so this guy was on the stage with him, he called him a great builder. Okay, he's his friend. But I want to make really clear the business ties between these two as we close out the story. Vornado and the Trump Organization are jointly invested in two buildings already, uh, one in Manhattan, one in San Francisco. Uh, Vornado is also in the midst of negotiations with uh, Jared Kushner's corporation about the future of uh, their 666 Fifth Avenue uh, skyscraper. I just, I love them. If you're a conspiracy theorist yeah. online, the fact what? that it's 666, that's just got to just make it so tingly. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you were a little kid growing up in New York, there was a little cafe on the top called Top of the Sixes, which was like was the, really? the B version of Windows on the World at the World yeah, Trade okay. Center. The so it was, a, it was a cheap way to yeah. get to the top of the building and have a piece <laughs> yeah. of cake with your grandmother. Now, we've talked about that building before, about how Jared Kushner invested a massive amount of money in this building as one of the first things that he did as like the head of this uh, organization. At, immediately prior to the Great Recession, by the way, which was a great call. Um, but look at look at how clear the connection here is. The company, Vernado, came to the rescue of the Kushners when it agreed to an arrangement that gave Vernado 49.5% of the office portion of 666 and 70% of the retail space. So potentially saving billions of dollars uh, for the Kushners there. And Kushner, of course, one of the chief advisors to Donald Trump, so whether it's Donald Trump's decision is that this guy gets it, or if it's to help pay off the aid that they've given to the Kushners, I mean, that is sick in either case, and it's happening right now uh, as we're filming this. It's a tornado shelter. It's a tornado shelter. How did they get so rich? I mean, look, those fans are not cheap, I'll grant you, but billionaires? <laughs> really? How complicated are those yeah. to build? They're lost anyway. leaders, those, those fans. <laughs> Yeah, there you bringing go. people in. Uh, so we're going to take uh, one more break in this first hour. You can tweet us at hashtag TYT Live, what you think about uh, these stories. Uh, which bothers you more? The, uh, the, the the single case of $2 billion worth of corruption, possibly from Vernado, or the countrywide corruption we're going to have in their infrastructure plan? Uh, tweet us at hashtag TYT Live. We'll be back in just a minute. TYT is unique in a lot of ways. I'm going to ask some uncomfortable questions. Right I feel now, like I missed yeah. out. So what is going on? If I don't eat, my head's going to explode. As I take my shirt off, just goes, is that your body? Well, now we move to the inappropriate story number two. I just never felt guilty about masturbation. It's amazing. I could take partial credit for opening up your sexuality. I was a kid in the pool with the shirt off. Let's just call it what it is. I was that kid. Well, you deal with the bitch side of it, <laughs> right? But you're my boss, so that's, that's what happens. I think we're more like they do see it from a frame of the rich and the powerful, and they don't realize it. The last time that happened, we elected Abraham Lincoln. I don't know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we unfucked the world? You and I are a disaster. Don't stereotype all cops, don't stereotype all any blowing up like Dave Kohler on Twitter. That's pretty good progress. I didn't know you could leave off the comments. It's a very few ideas. I'll show you a whole bunch of depressing stuff. So that at the end, I can give you a book. Winning is, in terms of change, of positive change, is not just possible, it's inevitable. Great time to be alive. But burn this mother down, not what you're saying? Fuck it, let's go do it. That's why I thank you guys for being members. Because together, we got their attention. Thanks for tuning in, and as always, stay strong. Stay strong. Establishment media, corporate media, as I like to say, um, it's really not journalism. It's kind of become this infotainment, substanceless drivel, and horse race obsession. They all live in this echo chamber in this bubble because they have no idea what like actual people uh, are, are dealing with. Most people uh, have their jobs sent offshore, or are now working free jobs, you know, are struggling just to afford health care. I mean, in going across the country and reporting. I'm talking to people who have to like decide between can I take my medication this week or get groceries. Like they have no clue because they're more interested in you know what Trump tweeted or the the debt ceiling showdown and you know all this stuff that they try to prop up in terms of like almost a, a movie script. You know like sensational and you know protagonist and conflict and all this. 
and the victims of that are actual people. And I think that's why people are responding to us, because uh, you know, I'm not out covering like the sexy story. My biggest passion is just kind of showing that the, the folks in the work that are part of the working poor, or formerly middle class, you know, these are not the takers. There's actually been a systematic con job, uh, and they've been con. We've all been con by, you know, what I call the corporate media, military, industrial complex. Kind of long winded. But there's been an active uh, cabal, so to speak, uh, of corporations, lobbyists, banks, politicians, and the media to essentially concentrate power in, in, into, uh, you know, one vacuum and lead people in Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania. It's not just the Rust Belt, but in all over the country, kind of scrapping for the crops. So, what do we do? I think, honestly, you know, people say, oh, I couldn't do it without you. You know, I always thought those celebrities were bullshit artists. But we can't do it without you. I mean, it took years for them just to hire me because they didn't have the funds to hire a reporter. Now they've hired two, two more and possibly more on the way. So the first thing you can do is if you like me, if you like what you're doing, let's create more. The Go campaign is a great way. Even if you only can get 10 bucks, 20 bucks, it all makes a big difference. So if you can contribute, and that's not just to hire more reporters, it takes an army, producers, editors, researchers, cameramen, um, all that. So uh, the Go campaign, as well as become a member. Everybody, uh, Mark and Michael and John. Uh, we've got two more stories we want to get to on some of Donald Trump's legal problems and their new uh, strategy and how they're going to deal with the special counsel. But first, a few tweets. Uh, Amadurpi Panda says, uh, Wow, he's literally selling America piece by piece. Government should run like a business, right? That's true. Um, this is one of the things about the Trump presidency that we just all knew was going to come. It's just the, the the massive looting. Of, again, it's another one of the things that he shares with so many third world dictators is it's for him and his family's personal enrichment. They take as much resources out, enrich their circle of friends. Um, we had a big enough problem with the oligarchy before this. Right. Uh, uh, of course, right, right, and writer. The only thing that surprises me is how naked the whole thing is. I mean, you know, like it's the first thing, the chair's not even warm yet. And, yeah, that's and we're talking about this. I, I, that that struck me most when he was sitting in Saudi Arabia at the first leg on the first leg of that Middle Eastern trip. Actually, it's the only time he was in the Middle East. Apparently, according to him, was when he was in Saudi Arabia. But but when he was there, because they're they're the kings of it. But they are literally that's what they do: is making each other rich, making the family rich, making the people that are close to the family rich. And he was there doing this deal and sort of making relationships with his people. And that's where I thought, my God, this is. 120 days in, we're already here. Yeah. That's true, yeah. It, it was fast. It was definitely fast. Um, let's see. Uh, one other tweet. The Forgotten Arm says, uh, so private developers will toll the roads. Will they also be legally responsible for any failures from their construction work? I don't know. I would That's assume a point. that they'll still be. <laughs> That's a point. Um, and, and here, uh, I, I checked off on that same thing. I think it's a really good point. One of two things will happen. Either the government, you and I, will indemnify them so that they, by taking this project, will not be responsible. But if there is a problem, will be responsible. Or there can be legal action, but it can be tied up in the courts for years and years and years. So that if somebody gets killed on a yeah. road that was built in a defective way, the family's not going to recover any money and the, and the company's not going to be held to account for probably a very long time. But I, I think it's a really decent point. Yeah. Yeah, and it's amazing that, like, as much as I would hate any toll whatsoever, I, I, there's got to be examples of this, but the idea that 
sort of implicitly it has to go to a private corporation. Like that theoretically it couldn't be set up so that it continues to generate money and benefit for that location or for the state or something like that. It's that obviously the road's got to help some rich dude. Uh, it's a weird power country. Yeah, that's, that's bizarre. And by the way, and then we can move on, but, you know, contractors are hired to build roads and bridges in this country or to take on a certain project of one sort or another. They bid on it. Yeah. There's competitive bidding, and then one is awarded the job. When it's done, it's done. If that's a toll yes. road, those tolls, we are accrued to us. We make money as taxpayers on those. So yeah, and so automatically I, people are going to make money. I mean, to say that there's a difference is, is you know, the, oh, why shouldn't people be making money? The people that win those bids do well. They hire people. They, you know, for, and everything gets a bid. Where you buy the asphalt? Who ships the asphalt? Who lays the asphalt? I mean, there's so many different layers to it. If you give it just to, to you know, to, whatever this guy's name is, uh, Bornado, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, but if you, if you just give it to one of your friends and you privatize it everywhere, they'll, every, there's going to just be a small number of people that are making money. Exactly. And they're going to try and create the fewest jobs and try and, try and, and keep their costs as low as they can so it all goes in their pockets. Totally. Okay, uh, let's turn to our last two stories, which I do think that we can get to. Well, Donald Trump and his minions were quick to claim uh, that James Comey's testimony last week cleared him, that there's no story anymore. There's their comments since then about uh, Bob Mueller's uh, uh, status as the special counsel indicate that they might well not be as confident as they're letting on. Uh, Newt Gingrich, who we know has an interesting relationship with Donald Trump, tweeted this. Republicans are delusional if they think the special counsel is going to be fair. Look who he is hiring. Check FEC reports. Time to rethink. Well, he's apparently been doing some rethinking because earlier he tweeted this. Bob Mueller is superb choice to be special counsel. His <laughs> reputation is impeccable for honesty and integrity. Media should now calm down. New, you might well want to calm down because as I tweeted earlier, um, yeah, things come at you fast on Twitter sometimes. <laughs> Let's put those next to each other. I mean, we're, we're basically talking about less than a month. Uh, you bring this next one from... A guy who is obviously has so much honesty and integrity that people cannot attack him to, dear God, get this guy out of here as quick as possible. I have a feeling Newt Gingrich was familiar with Mueller before the first tweet was sent. I don't think it was a new name to him necessarily. Um, but he then went on, uh, I believe on Sunday, uh, he was on a radio show and he said this. The key thing to me was that I think Congress should now intervene and it should abolish the independent counsel because Comey makes so clear that it's the poison proof of a deliberate manipulation by the FBI director leaking the New York Times to deliberately uh, set up uh, this particular situation. It, I think it's very sick. Why does he matter, honestly? Why does he, he matter English? anymore? I, uh, I mean, he, his name comes up when positions are possible or right. things in the Trump administration. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know where he, he, he opens his mouth and he's a compelling talking head. Exactly. He's an articulate spokesman for the right, and he is showing up a lot in media, and in this environment, showing up a lot in media makes a difference. So I think really that is his universe. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I sort of use him as a shorthand for uh, Me Media Matters has a great uh, compilation that they put out a, a day or two ago of this sort of talking point. There was uh, Law News had an editorial over the weekend that obviously Mueller has to recuse himself on anything having to do with James Comey. Uh, and any number of uh, right-wingers on the radio or online uh, are now pushing this, this idea that he is obviously flawed, he's obviously biased, both Comey but, but also Mueller. Um, and I don't think that they would be saying that again. All this behavior from Donald Trump before the firing of Comey, uh, how he's responded after the firing, and now the way his defenders are, are protecting him, this is not the behavior of people who believe there's nothing to be found. That think that if this investigation continued, there'd be no there there. They're acting like people who are walking the plank and they're trying to talk their way out of it before they have to step off. That's what it seems like to me. Anyway, uh, let's go to one more quick topic. So Donald Trump, uh, because of the position that he holds that I won't name, uh, has access to White House lawyers. It just comes with the job. And those are the sort of people who are experienced with the particular sort of investigation that he now finds himself the target of. They understand how to counsel people to protect themselves, to prepare for uh, congressional testimony, or you know, speaking to someone like the special counsel, Bob Mueller. 
they know how to act in that situation. And so obviously Donald Trump has no interest in using them, and he's decided to use his goofball lawyer uh, instead. So uh, this is uh, uh, Mark Kasowitz. Now, the New York Times reported on Sunday of this week that Kasowitz has told White House personnel that they will not need to obtain legal representation of their own and urge them not to speak to the media about the investigation into Trump and, and you know all of that related stuff. Now, when Comey was initially fired, let alone after his testimony, the, the dominant message that I heard from a lot of people was, this is a time for people who work in the White House to get some sort of representation. That in the past, like when Bill Clinton was being investigated, that's what you do. Um, and it seems odd that his personal lawyer would be telling them not to do that. That they should effectively, like, clam up, don't talk to the media, but other than that, just sort of hang tight. That seems odd to me. That seems like a strategy designed not to protect them, but to potentially leave them out to be investigated or attacked, and then maybe to thereby protect Trump? I'm not sure. Well, I think a lawyer who looks at Donald Trump um, sees that every case he may have is undone by his talking, either mm -hmm. going on air, tweeting, writing in certain cases. I mean, I think that that's, uh, that, that's part of it, too. Uh, so I think a lot of that is why a personal lawyer would say that and advise that to sort of try and because Don McGahn is the White House counsel and he's somebody who clearly doesn't think it's a bad idea to stop the tweeting because he's been on the Trump campaign he's been in the Trump White House he's been doing this now for quite a while um, and he's you know he's got his own beat in that White House but this guy comes in and he's he has, he just has a client and the client isn't the White House the client's the president or Trump uh, and so. I think that there's probably, that's why he is trying to curb this, but I don't think that it matters at this point because it seems like so much has been said by this president that he's already, it's, it's already dug in, which is why, yeah, the damage is done, which is why you're not seeing very much. Yeah, I think they're worried about contradictory things being said. You know, that's one of the things, as Michael says, when the president tweets, he tweets one thing, then he tweets a different thing. Uh, it happened on the Muslim ban, and, and it continues to get them into trouble, and it goes on down the line. It's not just limited to the president. So when White House staffers start, uh, speaking and then contradicting themselves and they can't get their story straight, all of that can have a legal effect. Uh, by the way, this lawyer is the guy who settled that Trump University case for 25 million bucks, which we were talking about on Friday. Yeah, maybe that was a good deal for Trump, I don't know. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, and just, just to make clear that, that what you were saying, and a, and a recent example of him uh, shooting himself in the foot, Donald Trump, making it worse for himself by speaking in an attempt to defend himself, you have the, the tape situation that supposedly he has these recordings of James Comey, and it, he must have seen that as a good move to bring that up, but he's really put himself in a position where he's either going to be hurt by it or he's going to be hurt, hurt worse by it. If the tapes exist, my gut and everything I know about James Comey and Donald Trump tells me that they will back up James Comey's account of what was said. But we all know that it's unlikely that the tapes do exist, and if they don't exist, that's even worse for Donald Trump. Because if you're investigating obstruction of justice, how does it look if a president makes up recordings to try to get a potential witness in a court case to be quiet. I mean, that is intimidation beyond, I mean, it's, it's fantastical at that point, and it's likely to be the case. Um, now, just two other quick points to give you an idea about Mark Kasowitz. Um, it's an interesting game to play to try to find someone in the Trump administration that doesn't have some sort of weird connection to uh, Russian oligarchs. Uh, we're still playing it because this is a case where we, we don't win. Uh, Kasowitz's other main clients include Sparebank, the largest state-owned bank in Russia, which was sanctioned by the Obama administration, and Oleg Deripaska, the Russian tycoon, close to President Vladimir Putin, who has had business dealings with Paul Manafort. So that's who he's representing on the side. And by the way, uh, to give you an idea about this guy, Mark Kasowitz, this is going to be the most shallow critique of Kasowitz you're going to hear today. But he's the guy that wrote this in response to Comey's testimony. It started... I am Mark Kasowitz, President Trump's personal lawyer. <laughs> he wow. misspelled president in an official letter wow. defending the tr uh, Donald Trump against James Comey's uh, testimony. Shallow, I know. Um, but it sounds like you'll fit right in with the crew that's making yeah, decisions. Will. Uh, anyway, I wish that we had more time, a lot more to talk to, including Donald Trump's uh, absolutely laughable press conference from earlier today. Uh, but that's all the time we have. Uh, thank you, Michael and Mark, for joining me. Uh, and by the way, Sean Spicer's short. Is that what you were talking about? The short. I didn't actually see Sean Spicer. Yeah, in it. They're getting shorter and shorter. There's less and less oh, access the actual to, press the, to those press conferences. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
there's less and less access for the press yeah. to the White House. And I meant the uh, like sort of self congratulatory. I know we'll that, that was the yeah, R. I understand. Yeah, I should yeah. be covered. But it's, yeah. it's, it should be lampooned. Yeah. Now, uh, right before we leave, if there's anything you'd like to plug, where can people see more of your work? Well, you can hear Michael on my podcast, which is called The Edge. Find an edge dash show dot com also on iTunes places like that and YouTube for that matter. Yeah. I, I was just told we're on YouTube. I didn't even know that. But uh, <laughs> Michael's there, and also a lot of other uh, interesting conversations go down there too. Edge dash show dot com. And if you want to see more of Michael, uh, his classic program enthusiasm episode, he's on. Yeah, yeah I won't recognize it. Or you can you can look for i twenty four news. Have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're gonna take a short break. When we come back. Uh, I believe Hannah, uh, my co-host from Think Tank, is going to be leading uh, an awesome second hour. They've got some great stories, uh, a lot of uh, pride-related uh, stories, some threats. Wait until you see the stats on uh, the violence against the LGBT community over the past year. It is tragic. And, and today is the this. one-year anniversary of Orlando, the Pulse nightclub. So yeah, exactly, yeah. the stories to yes. coincide with that. Yep. So there will be coverage of that when we come back from this break. The real uh, legend in the room is Jesus Godoy doing stage managing here. The Steven Spielberg of Internet TV. Come, come here for a sec. Okay, we got to get you back on, man. There he is, man. Chief Justice. What are you doing stage managing? Yeah. yeah why are you here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <damn. laughs> so that's like Spielberg coming in on a movie and, and doing like uh, Best Boy or Best Grip or what do they call those? There's like Grip and then there's Best Boy. Grip. There's a Best Boy, right? Is a that is the most unfortunate name for any job. Ever. Uh, hey, what do you do? I'm a best boy. All right, dude. Hey, listen, man, whatever pays the bills. So I am my, I now kind of have this year and a half sense. What, what, what's your sense? You mean how long is he going to be in office? Yeah. And how does this end and all that? Dude, there's no way of knowing. My biggest fear is it's not that he's a right wing, you know, fascist. Mm -hmm. It's the gross incompetence. That's um, what I've been saying from day one. The, the security team yeah. is that it's an, it's an inability to understand how the world actually functions. And added to this is casual racism mm. layered on top of ignorance because he's never read a book. So you have a president who's going through life with like, Whatever the 1950s racist mentality is that he got from his father that he probably never gave up, who thinks somehow we can fuck with China because they're Chinese. And that Steve Bannon guy thinks he's so fucking clever, like, oh, let me do this populist thing, and let me do that, and let me do this. But if you're racist, you're not that clever. I mean, you couldn't even figure out they were all the fucking same. <laughs> <laughs> He's a war hero. He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? You said I had small hands. You're not small. I never heard that one before.
Turks, Hannah Cranston here with Miss Ambria Allen and Mark Thompson. Of course, sticking around for the second hour. Uh, we have a chock full hour for you guys, so I want to uh, dive right into it. Some serious stories. We do have some fun stories. Uh, we're going to finish on a story about Wonder Woman, and then afterwards in the post game, I will tell you guys about a crazy story that happened to me uh, when I went to go see Wonder Woman last week. Weekend, so make sure that you are a member uh, so that you can see post games like this. Uh, how was the first hour, Mark? It was very good, although too many guys on the panel in yeah. the first hour. This is this is really an upgrade for me, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're glad to be here for that. Um, let's jump into it uh, kind of with a serious story. So a year ago today, 49 people were killed in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and now the uh, owner, Pulse, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm going to restart that. A year ago today, 49 people were killed in the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, marking it the U.S.'s most deadliest killing ever. Now, uh, the owner, Barbara Poma, spoke out about the loss. Take a look at the video here. I miss Pulse. I miss everything it stood for. I miss serving the LGBTQ plus community, our Latin community, in a way that only a gay bar can. I am grateful and comforted when I hear your memories and I see your pictures of the best times of your lives. It breaks my heart that your sanctuary was taken from you. But I know we are resilient. And I know we will not let hate win. So obviously that was extremely moving. She also held a memorial service at the nightclub. Um, now the memorial service didn't actually begin until 1.45 a.m. with opening remarks from her about love and healing. Then at 2.02 a.m., um, the exact time that gunman Omar Mateen fired his first bullet, the ministers read aloud the 49 names of the dead. Now you can see here a picture of the large group that made a circle outside of the club. Now, Pulse has actually been boarded up since the event last year, but last month, Poma announced her plans to turn the site into a memorial and museum by the year 2020. Now, obviously, the shooting last year was devastating, but it was not the only time that the LGBTQ community faced a violent backlash. Now, excluding Pulse victims, 28 Americans who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and or transgender were killed in 2016, which was up 17% from 24 killed the previous year. Now, last year was actually the deadliest year for uh, members of the LGBTQ community, uh, which is really, really terrifying, right? Because I think this is a year or a time when we're supposed to be more tolerant and more accepting, and it's really, really unfortunate and sad that we're still facing, you know, these these hate crimes now, including the Pulse victims from the numbers that I talked about before. Uh, murders of LGBT people rose two hundred and seventeen percent. Okay. Um, now, obviously, people uh, within the LGBTQ community, uh, people of color, people with disabilities, are actually twice as likely as whites and able bodies to be the victims of harassment. And something that might surprise you is that most of the victims knew their attackers, who were commonly uh, employees or employers, neighbors, landlords, and family members. So this is uh, June is Pride Month. And so, obviously, that is why uh, the attacker last year at Pulse targeted it uh, that night. And so now, as a way to sort of, like, remember what happened, um, I like that she is sort of coming out and, you know, saying that she's going to now make a museum and a memorial for those members who passed away. It's funny. I went by the Pulse Night Club. It was just a few months ago, and it, it's weird. I mean, I'm not down in that area ever, but I was on my way to the to port to catch a boat. And we were passing, it was, it was late at night, maybe it was 11 or midnight even, and it was, while boarded up, mm -hmm. surrounded by flowers, surrounded mm -hmm. by like a living memorials to what happened there. So that community is still very connected to that place and to remembering that history. And the other thing that strikes me is that it's kind of, as Hannah was saying, you know, we this is a time when the LGBTQ community is taking such a, an assault 
coming off of such victories, you know, the same-sex mm. marriage acts, these, the, the strides that were made by those communities seem so significant. And now we find ourselves uh, in a situation where that community is sort of on the defensive, I think, a bit. I think, I think members of that community have always been on the defensive, and I think that's what we're seeing in some of... Uh, the reporting, uh, or should I say lack thereof, that LGBTQ folks of color um, typically are are the targets of violence, and this violence goes unreported. It's often not adequately covered, despite the fact that with Pulse, we see um, that folks of color were um, disproportionately affected. Mm. Um, and even in uh, certain pride marches, we still see um, LGBTQ folks trying uh, to decenter whiteness um, as kind of the focus of these movements, um, despite the fact that instances of violence disproportionately affect um, people of color, uh, folks who are not able-bodied or who are differently abled. So I think that despite the fact that there have been these um, this progress, that folks of color are still disproportionately negatively affected by, by violence within um, the community. So I think that that's kind of what uh, I think that the record or the report uh, is getting at, is that um, we need some adequate coverage. And I think if we have more coverage, we also force a conversation around uh, sexual identity and race, an, an intersectional conversation that I feel like we need to have when we talk about LGBTQ, you know. I agree with you. I do think that we need to have more an intersectional mm -hmm. conversation. I think the problem here lies that there is a conversation that's happening in society right now. And unfortunately, it's on the wrong side. And I think that's a lot of the times where we're seeing this sort of uptick in violence because Trump is, you know, passing these religious liberty executive orders. He is uh, revoking protections for, for federal contractors and not protecting uh, people of color, people within the LGBTQ community, uh, disabled people. So there's so much of this rhetoric out there that I think that there is more of an acceptance for violence against them or uh, hate speech against people within these communities than ever before. So it's a conversation that we don't really want to be a part of and we need to shift it back to the progress that you were talking about and towards tolerance and acceptance. But as Hannah says, that legislative, those legislative rollbacks are significant, right? right. It's not just the rhetoric. It's the yeah. fact that they're really rolling back legislative gains. So uh, this is a, a turning point and uh, it's frightening because of the negative rhetoric and because of those moves, uh, you you need to have any kind of dialogue or any kind of conversation now, and it's harder to have it, uh, much less the, the intersectional dialogue, as you sure. speak of. Uh, I, I think you make a really great point. I, I actually am embarrassed to say I hadn't really considered it, that you know, within an oppressed community, there's even a more oppressed community. Sure. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot, unfortunately, that's negative at this moment in time. Yeah. Very true. Um, moving on. In an effort to celebrate the start of Pride Month this June, Abercrombie and Fitch tweeted out that Pride is for everyone, not just the LGBTQ community, a sentiment that was rightfully met with a lot of backlash. Now, uh, of course, this is a quote from Kayla, a merchandiser, um, and then she <laughs> adds at the Trevor Project, which is uh, a collaboration that Abercrombie and Fitch is doing with the Free Suicide Prevention Hotline for young LGBTQ uh, people, so at least they're kind of doing something right there. Um, now, Obviously, they got a lot of backlash for that tweet, um, and then they deleted the tweet and then responded with two pseudo-apology tweets. Uh, it says, Pride is an important time for the LGBTQ community. At a &F, we work to ensure that everyone feels included, respected, and empowered. Hashtag Pride. And then they said, uh, we are proud to show commitment to the LGBTQ plus community and to bring awareness to the important work uh, the Trevor Project does so they just missed that whole like we're sorry part <laughs> but otherwise the sentiment was there and i think a lot of people that are responding to this on twitter are really calling to attention something really important here because by saying the pride community is everybody not just lgbtq people they really miss the point right so pride talks about being proud to be a part of this community regardless of sort of the uh bigotry that you may 
face, right, as being part of that community. So it really is for that. Now, they're conflating two different issues here uh, with being proud for uh, being proud to be a part of that community. And then the other issue is being an ally for that community. Now, I do think that everybody can be an ally for that community. But what they basically did here with this comment from Kayla uh, is sort of apply the all lives matter argument to the pride community. And that is messed up. So I'm glad that people uh, called them out. I wish they would have had a better apology. Um, but they are, you know, trying to do work with the, you know, community with, uh, with you know, with their work with Trevor Project. So I'm not, I want to give them credit for that. What do you mm -hmm. guys think? I think this is what happens when, when corporate interest supersedes a thoughtful understanding of an issue. Mm. We saw this with Pepsi. Um, so although they are supporting the Trevor Project, um, you, you always have to call into question the motivation behind uh, the support. Um, and also, you know, do our research in examining what other uh, you know, corporations or interests that they, they serve. A lot of corporations kind of simultaneously support uh, organizations that seem progressive and then organizations that fund mass incarceration or other kind of uh, interests that uh, disproportionately harm communities of color. So Abercrombie has never been on the right side of issues. Um, this is not their first, um, you know, yeah, misstep. So I'm, I'm just, you know, suspicious. I mean, you, you, you said it right, of course, it's the Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter thing all over again. It's right. just simply that. And uh, after that, it's how you backpedal from it and try to retain some dignity for your company because it's clearly a grab uh, of the spotlight, which is on this community, which needs the spotlight. And now you're trying to nudge your way in as a company mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to, to, for commercial purposes. But it's, it's that all over again. It's Black Lives, All Lives, all over again. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, with these sorts of scenarios, there is a really great opportunity for learning, right, that can be had if some, if they had realized their misstep, realized that maybe they, maybe Kayla minced her words, maybe she meant that we're all trying to be allies, whatever Kayla meant, we don't know, um, or that, you know, uh, as John brought up during the production meeting, that maybe this was just like an intern who didn't fully understand, sure. or whatever it may be, but it's still a great opportunity to be like, we're sorry, this, that we messed up, but here's what we actually meant, and here are the ways that we're supporting this community. Now we're going to feature all of our white, super skinny models and in <laughs> gay relationships, whatever it may be, and making sort of like... Or that feature real gay yeah, relationships. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, I know, I know. Or people of color, or hire people of color. That would yeah. be great. Or pretend gay relationships, or pretend people of color. We're going to do something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, they should have made a few more strides to to remedy the situation. I mean, they should have made a few more strides to uh, be more supportive. Yeah, yeah, in the from the outset. Um, but it is. I mean, I'm glad that people are are dragging them for this because it was a huge misstep, whether it be on uh, Abercrombie and Fitch's shoulders or whether it be on Kayla's. Poor Kayla. It would really not be fun to be. <laughs> well, before you insert yourself into an issue, make sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, by the way, I, it is true, just as an aside, and we'll move on, but uh, you know, you should run a tweet like that past somebody else. I mean, really. Uh, so. No, I mean, the thing is, is like, you could, there's no way that out of the entire Abercrombie, uh, what is it, campus, that there was not somebody on the marketing team or the social media team who either is an ally or who is aware or who is a part of the LGBTQ community that saw this tweet and was like, Meh, maybe not a good idea. I never understand how these things sort of like slip through yeah. the cracks. Um, all right, moving on to more fun. So former FBI Director James Comey testified in front of the Senate Select Committee and before America last week, and it turned out his ratings are gold. <laughs> now, roughly 19.5 million Americans tuned in on Thursday, uh, even though the testimony was at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 a.m. Uh, Western now, to just put some of those numbers into context for you, that is about the same number of people who watched Game 2 of this week's NBA Finals between the Golden State Warriors and Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, uh, the viewership figure released on Friday by the television tracking firm Nielsen did not include statistics for PBS, C-SPAN, or the Fox Broadcasting affiliates that carried the hearing live. So, obviously, this number is a lot bigger than we're recording right now. 
nor did it include uh, streaming platforms or those who congregated at viewing parties, which apparently was a very large percentage, uh, because apparently testimonies are our new Super Bowl. Now, uh, Twitter and Bloomberg News also said that their joint live stream reached an average of 129,000 viewers a minute, which is insane. But Trump still gets bragging rights uh, when it comes to ratings, because in his inauguration brought in 30.6 million television viewers, now, James Comey also called him a liar, and then Trump called him a liar back. Um, but uh, it turns out that most Americans actually believe what Comey has to say instead of Trump. Now, Huffington Post YouGov poll conducted on June 8 and 9 uh, revealed that 46% of Americans consider Comey to be more honest and trustworthy than Trump. Now, on the other hand, only 26% believed Trump to be uh, the more trustworthy one. And there was a slight difference between political parties there. Uh, figure that. Uh, Republicans were far more in favor of Trump, 58%, and chose him as the most, more trustworthy pick, while 78% of Democrats put their trust in Comey. So we have a problem <laughs> that our Americans don't trust our president, but then, like, it also, I mean, it didn't really shift people's um I, I guess, like, view of the administration, right? So 43% of those polls said that after Thursday's hearing, even though they didn't trust our president uh, and they trusted Comey more after what he was saying, their view of the Trump administration stayed exactly the same. This is terrifying. This is absolutely terrifying. This is one of those situations in which people get what they want out of it, though. You know, if you're uh, already uh, a Trump hater, uh, if you already feel this administration is an abomination, an insult to what this, this country stands for, a money grab, uh, an oligarch who has, uh, has uh, ascended through this uh, already oligarchical machine, if you believe that, then it's like, yeah, look at James Comey. If you think this guy is a successful businessman, is trying to bring that success to Washington, all he needs is for people to get off his back and let him do his thing, then you kind of view Comey as this guy who's getting in his way. I think this is the country we're living in now. Uh, but you're right. When you look at those stark figures, it's hard to believe that everyone isn't on the same page because so many are. Right. You can't trust President Trump. He's demonstrably a liar. We know that. Well, within the same exact poll, there was a, a majority percentage of people who also believed that Trump fired Comey over the Russian thing. So, like, even though they, like, want him to, to bring business back and bring jobs back, whatever it may be, the majority of people still think that they fired him over the Russia thing, which is still, like, whether you're Republican or Democrat, like, that's still an obstruction of justice. And I think what, what we miss in these numbers, right, uh, about ratings and the fact that all of us were tuned in is that there were a, a large swath of the population who was at work, right? Like, yeah. working class folks um, were, you know, they, they care, but they want to know how this Comey issue is going to land on the ground mm. in their everyday lives, right? So it's important, but... I think there is this kind of disassociation between what's going on with, with Trump and Russia and Comey and the reality show of these trials and my everyday life. I've still got to go to work. I've still got to make ends meet. So how, how does this affect me personally every day? You know, whereas the rest of us, you know, I watch because I've never seen so many white men in court, you know, and, and this is like, it's, and now we have sessions, like this is the best yeah. moment of time. I'm going to keep True. watching as long as they keep testifying. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is I think there are a lot of part, a lot of portions of what we're seeing right now with the Trump administration that do appear to be a reality uh, TV. But I think this was like real life. I think this kind of brought everybody down to earth and was like, oh shit, like this is actually happening. He has this, these contemporaneous memos that are detailing out how effed up our president is. And, like, he's running our country, and he doesn't know. And the excuse that we're getting from Republicans right now uh, is that, oh, well, this is his first rodeo, guys. Like, give him a break. And that's not an excuse for doing these sorts of effed up things. Yeah, and he so, did call the president a liar, which is a crime. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that was probably the crescendo moment. It came early on, but he did yeah. probably call him a liar. And, uh, uh, and the other way it's being uh, really spun mm. is that, well, this is a disgruntled uh, guy sure. because he was fired by this president. So you're here. That's the other way I think the right is spinning it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's possible, and, you know, he may, maybe that's why, even though he's, like, said in his contemporaneous notes, you know, he wasn't fired yet, and so he felt he had to need, he had the, the need mm. to take those, so maybe that's, I think there's one really big positive takeaway from this, in that, like, so many people are interested in politics and are seeing whether they think it's effed up or they think that he's disgruntled or whatever it may be, people are tuning in and want to pay attention. Like even when they can only watch part of it from work via, you know, Twitter stream or whatever it may be, people are starting to pay attention. They want to be informed. They want to understand what's going on. And hopefully that motivates people uh, and, and continues the, the activation that I think we've seen from the, the resist movement. Yeah, if that if, yeah. if if that does activate them to become involved in ways more than just watching this reality show, yeah. then it's a net win. What I worry about is oh, they're they're watching this thing. It's a they're looking for a gotcha moment. Watching TV is fun, especially if there are a bunch of you know rich white guys on there lying. I mean, it's all it plays like a Law and Order episode, or you know. Uh, but, but the problem is, there's a lot of other stuff being done in the back rooms of Washington or in the front rooms of Washington. There's still a lot of public land being leased for. Uh, mineral rights and all the rest. Trump is signing executive orders, taking away people's rights sure, left and right. right. And so, uh, I guess, uh, I hope, is my, my okay. point, uh, that you're right, that this activates people to be involved beyond just watching the Comey and ultimately the, the Sessions testimonies. Yeah, no, there's one more point I, I want to make, too, on, on Comey's trustworthiness. And a lot of people online sort of made this parallel, too, and I put out a tweet when I was watching it, um, because a lot of the Republicans were like, why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell them this was wrong? Why didn't you say stop? Which is something that I think a lot of women face in the workplace when they're dealing with harassment or something like that, and they deal with that victim blaming. So he still does, even though he sort of experienced something similar to that a lot of women experience in the workplace, he still does have the white male privilege in that the majority of people still think he's trustworthy and telling the truth. So... No, he has that again, on his side. <laughs> that's a great, see, that's what you get when you have women on the panel. You get that perspective. I think that's a very good point. Yeah. That why didn't you say no? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's a, um, and obviously, and his answer is probably that answer that, you know, so many people who would be uh, female victims of sexual harassment, are, I was shocked. I didn't yeah, know sure. what to, you know. It, and anybody who's parallels. in the face of power and who doesn't want to, you know, lose their job. Sure. So there's several parallels with sexual harassment, but also uh, racial discrimination that people of mm. color face in the workplace that it's irrational, right? And I think that that's what we see. That's what I saw when I was watching Comey's testimony is that white supremacy, racism, sexism is irrational, right? Mm. And that it, it, you often don't know how to respond because it's so ridiculous, it's so reckless that your response is then irrational. But instead of calling into question the irrationality of, of the power structure, you get called into question, mm -hmm. right? And they go into his uh, credibility, right? These are folks who were once in support of Comey, of Comey who are now saying, you know, he's crazy. And so I, it does play out in, in, in ways that we see racial discrimination and sexual harassment um, cases play out. Yeah, well, maybe as these, uh, you know, conversations continue, he'll be asked what he was wearing. So we'll find out. <laughs> All right, That's moving totally. on. On our favorite state media program, Fox and Friends, Ivanka Trump was asked about the difficulty of being a part of the White House. And she talks about how vicious her father's critics are for her. Let's take a look at the video. Is it harder than you thought, though? Is it harder than you thought to stick to the things you want to do because of what keeps coming up, whether it's the Russia investigation or something else? It, it is hard, and there's a level of viciousness that I was not expecting. I was not inspe expecting the intensity of this experience. But this isn't supposed to be easy. Mm -hmm. My father and this administration intends to be transformative. And we want to do big, bold things. And we're looking to change the status quo. So I didn't expect it to be easy. I think um, some of the distractions and, and some of the, uh, the ferocity was um, I was a little blindsided by on a personal level. Alrighty, okay. so I'm just going to reiterate some of my uh, favorite quotes from that. She said, there's a level of viciousness that I was not expecting. 
I was not expecting the intensity of this experience because somebody looks at the White House and they're like, meh, you know. Uh, then she said, couldn't tell by the way, by the, from the way the Obamas were treated, it might be kind of a rough ride. <laughs> then she said, some of the distractions and some of the ferocity I was a little blindsided by on a personal level. Now, I have a lot of thoughts about this, uh, one of which is that she said that a lot of uh, the struggles that she is dealing with currently are made up for by the people that she meets when she's out on the road, uh, poor or working class people that she gets to, that are, you know, greet her with smiling faces because clearly they don't realize that her father's administration is going to totally F them over. Also, when we're talking about viciousness, I, I don't think that responding to the viciousness of her father's administration is necessarily, like, I definitely think he gets a lot of hate, right? But a lot of the times that's just in response to the viciousness that he is putting on our country, you know, when it turns, like, the way that he is treating immigrants, the environment, the LGBTQ community, women, minorities, Muslims, whatever it may be, that's the real viciousness that we should be talking about, not that... Ivanka Trump is getting some mean tweets. Of course. He, I mean, he is the bully in chief. Before he even got to be president, he was taking on that Gold Star family. Remember the cons? He just, mm. I mean, what, what a, what a, what a supreme, miserable a-hole would do something like that. That's who her dad is. Don't lose sight of this. Uh, let me tell you, and how about when he mocked that, uh, the handicapped uh, mm -hmm. uh, New York Times right. journalist, okay? This is a guy, he, he's doing a mockery, uh, like almost a theatrical mockery up there. The guy's despicable. This is her father. And then she has the gall to go on Fox and Friends. And by the way, very tough question that Fox and Friends asked. <laughs> is it tougher than you thought? Wow, that's the kind of journalist you can count on from that. And, and, then, and, and, she is, and she's shocked by this? It's, it, it, it disgusts me. Yeah, I don't think she's shocked. This is a strategy of white supremacy, right? This is how it operates. It promotes and perpetuates <laughs> violence and then positions itself to be appalled by violence, right? Mm. This is what he does. This is what he's done on the campaign trail, you know, and it's not just the instances that you mentioned. It's the, I want to punch him in the face and I want to, like, all of these things are violent things and they're not subtly violent. They are actively violent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course we use Ivanka, we use her femininity, we use her whiteness, we use her position and stature to go on and talk about uh, feeling victimized or the ferocity of, of um, uh, these, you know, the viciousness of, of folks against Trump. It's like he couldn't go on TV and say he felt surprised because he is the embodiment of this violence. So I, I don't buy it. I think it's ridiculous, and I can see uh, right through it. But do you think that it, I mean, maybe it's a ploy. Maybe you're right. But at the same time, like, I think there's a chance that they live in this, like, bubble where they really do think that what they're doing might be right like that is what's scarier to me do you know what i mean like i think there's a chance that he may not realize how effed up he is i think we always do this when we when they're we always give folks particularly white men the benefit of like intent or maybe they're too even when they're stupid right it's like oh well maybe they're too stupid it's the same thing with comey he's never been president before he's never served in an office before so maybe he's just you know messing up because he needs to learn you can't be but that can't be your first job president cannot be your first job if you have no training but it can if you're trump you know so i think the benefit of the doubting uh, white men is just ridiculous. I don't think that you are unaware of saying crazy things, and then when you hear crazy things back toward you, you're surprised. Don't get me wrong, by calling him idiotic and yeah. and bigoted and, and not and living in a bubble, I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt. But I really I think there might be a chance that he is just in this sort of like scary tornado and people are just trying to like like move the tornado a little bit that way and move it a little bit this way nobody really has control over it and i don't like of course i'm not you know no 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 i don't think that you're excusing him at all no 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 and i think both can be true yeah. I think it is, no yes. it is true yep. that trump is dim He's profoundly incompetent. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's used to selling 
a bunch of crap based on slogans and stuff he just yeah. says. It's winning, winning, winning. Yep. This is going to be the best ever. This guy's the best ever. Don't worry. It's going to be incredible. Right. You just go to sleep. Uh, and, and when you wake up in the morning, it's going to be a, it's going to be a new America. He's used to that stuff, so he doesn't really know that. But that is reinforced by that white privilege thing you're mm -hmm. talking about. So I think in this yeah. case, those things coexist. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think I think sort of uh, Ivanka really doubles down on that here. I remember when her Woman Who Work book came out, came out, and she was saying. God, I had to sacrifice. I gave up my massages, okay? And then she's basically doing the same thing here, trying to be a victim again, being like, I just didn't expect, like, these mean tweets, and she's sort of falling under these haters gonna hate sort of uh, mentality when she doesn't realize that a lot of her inaction or action, you know, who knows whatever right. she's doing behind closed doors, are really affecting and get it, affecting millions of people and earning this response. And one last thing that I want to say, she says, uh, talks about the, you know, the ferocity of, of the people or, or her father's critics. And I think she's, you know, uh, I guess talking about the resist movement mm -hmm. and I want the resist movement to stay ferocious. Like I want them to keep up that ferocity. Yeah. And all this obscures the fact that she mm -hmm. has an office. Like in like, that, like it obscures all the nepotism that's happening. That's the question mm -hmm. that we should be asking is why are you serving in the administration? Um, instead of asking her how she feels about how her father is being critiqued. Well and put yourself in that position. Yes, and we we uh I was going to say bent the ethic rules for yes. the ethics rules for them, but not even. I mean, I think we broke it a bunch yeah. of for them. Absolutely. Uh, as you say, she's in the administration. She still has businesses that are benefiting by certain decisions that are being made. Okay. Uh, yep. It's a uh, look. This is a this is a horror show as far as I'm concerned. Yes. But to have Ivanka Trump complaining about anything is yes. insanity. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it is. All right, guys, we are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Uh, this one goes on. No, sir. They don't want to go along. Feel the snow. Now it's getting real cold. Good. Just as they can get your window. Six twenty four hours. <laughs> To the exclusive members coverage of 280 Post Game Live from Rebel Headquarters in sunny Los Angeles. So, Jason, the air is electric after yesterday. Post Game. He's talking about Miami. You know, the only thing about this, Jason, is we've heard the Miami stories. I'm looking at Gasparian's interest here. She's giving him the cordial glance to the side, but I just don't know if it's really there. Oh, that's where the vagina is! Oh, okay. uh, hey, That joke landed like Apollo 13 there, and then Gasparian gives up the courtesy uh, off, gives up the Edwin way. Had you had sex at that point, when you took that class? Anyways, so, hold a minute, oh, he's like, found oh, an opening. Yeah, is he right. finding his way to come by, Jason? I thought, oh, is Jake doing a couple of you with a comment, no one would have seen this coming. And he's in the mood, and there's some music in the background. He's got the sideburns, yeah. he has the long hair. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. won't find himself. There's no way he's ready to. I mean, I've been. Ah! Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's unbelievable. Every dog has his day, and this dog is having the best day of his day. <laughs> that was an outstanding post game. If tonight's post game is anything like last night's, we're in for another one. Exactly right, Brad. And don't forget to check out the TYT post game app for the Young Turks every weekday on TYTnetwork.com slash members live. Yeah, right. They're coming, Tony. Uh, I just shot a clip. It's time sensitive and it needs to be edited. <laughs> Did anybody call for it? Editor, editor. <laughs> Need this in an hour. Shared editor too. Fuck you. Welcome back to two ice sports, Jason and Francis here. This is where everybody has to listen. I am your host, 
trying to black well, Jason here talking to Blue Eyes Sports, Dirk and Jerk, Blue Eyes Sports, Steph Curry signed with Under Armour, and Strawberry Man, by the way, can you hear me? Fight on Blue Eyes Sports! Actually, we'll write the description box below instead of lying about the description box below. And it's a full Manila picture of the UK bacon. I don't know. And if I throw it in all, I'm going to be so. Oh, I Thompson. So we are going to head into some of your TYT live tweets. Alex says, I love this community. We will never be taken down. We've survived thousands of years of hate and we will flourish. I love that spirit. Uh, Septian Patterson says one year later and not one single piece of legislation for stricter gun laws. That's a really good point. Well, you don't have to look past Newtown to see how there'll never be any restrictions right. on guns. Yeah. If you can gun down all those school kids and not get anything, sure. then the, somebody blows God, a bunch yeah. of gay people away, and it's, I think you have even a lesser chance. It's just yeah. the culture. It's it's despicable. Yeah. I, I, yeah, you make a really good point. I don't know what else it would take besides kids. Um, the next one is Woke Pappy. Says Abercrombie and Fitch talks about acceptance towards everyone. Didn't the founder say that ugly people shouldn't wear their clothes? Uh, yeah, essentially. He also said, I think he like said something about people who were plus size. All of their ads feature just like very uh, skinny white people uh, in heterosexual relationships. So there's really no diversity, and they've had a bunch of issues uh, facing like an employee who wanted to wear a hijab to work. Like they've dealt with their fair share. And they should have sort of like taken a step back and be like, how should we approach this issue and do it the right way this time? But they unfortunately did not. Uh, just Ray here says the gay community is just another minority being appropriated by corporations to gain consumer capitalization. Right. That's what we were saying. Yeah. We were just trying to nudge into the spotlight. Right. And then uh, Tarye Peterside says, seriously, if Ivanka is so concerned about viciousness, maybe she should talk to her dad about his administration's policies. Yeah. yeah. Please do. <laughs> Please do. Um, let's talk about some more viciousness from her dad's policies. So ICE agents have continued their tirade amongst immigrant communities, and this time they have arrested a teenager just hours before his prom. Now this here is a picture of uh, Diego Ismael Puma Macancela, who is a citizen of Ecuador, and he was arrested at his cousin's home on Thursday morning. Now his cousin, Gabby Macancela, said a frightened Puma Macancela came to her apartment Wednesday night after his mother's arrest. 
Now, the following morning, she said they cowered in fear in one of the bedrooms when they heard agents banging on the door of her apartment. She says that he's not a criminal. He didn't do anything bad to nobody. He was just going to school, working. He was trying to make his dreams come true for him, for his family, and for us. I don't know why. He's just a kid. Now, the agency said that uh, Puma Mancantella is being held at a federal detention center and he is pending uh, deportation. Now, the school was notified and they're going to work with uh, attorneys to make, him, uh, make it so that he can uh, go back to school and finish up the school year so that he can graduate. Um, but, you know, this is where we are right now. This is the state of where we are, especially when it comes to uh, immigration and the way that ICE agents are cracking down on immigration. Now, uh, immigration arrests are actually up 38% um, under Trump, but deportations are down. Remember, they called uh, Obama the deporter in chief. But um, 150% increase in these arrests are non-criminal. So obviously that's the case here uh, with uh, Puma. So he is not a criminal, but you know the other side would argue that being in the country legally is criminal, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think, you know, when we see all of these people that are being deported and being arrested by ICE agents, um, a lot of that sort of gets covered by, you know, all of the craziness that is happening with the Trump administration, with Russia, with Comey, whatever it may be. And it takes sort of these really... Um, sad cases, right? You know, the high school or before hours before prom to really drive it home and have a more evocative uh, effect for us to remember all of the awful things that ICE agents are essentially doing uh, around the country. Well, these are, the cases like this are sort of the low-hanging fruit of the immigration problem. You know, you know where these people are, they go to school, they have jobs. So they're not even really problem citizens in any way. But because you know where they are, they have jobs and going to school, you can round them up, which yeah. is what happened here. So it, it, it's, it, it's oddly not solving any problems per se, right. so it doesn't really fall under the banner of what ICE is, in essence, charged to do by yeah. this administration anyway. It's, it's not solving problems, it's actually creating problems, because a lot of the times local police work with their local immigrant communities so that they can deal with the problems uh, from criminal immigrants, right? And so it turns out that in this case, that a lot the local police received prior notification that ICE would be in the local area conducting these targeted enforcement actions. They didn't really do anything about it, and they didn't sort of provide that buffer. And so they are losing that trust from this community, and so it's going to create more problems, right? So when when local police don't uh, work with ICE agents, you know, that's called the sanctuary community, and those communities are a lot safer and have less crime than communities who do not do that. Agreed. I think it, 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 it does create a problem that it undermines the efficacy of other justice efforts, mm -hmm. like you were mentioning. Um, just the fact that under this administration that there are victims of domestic violence who are being targeted, right? That, it, that it, other, um, I guess, aspects of the justice system cannot operate effectively if you create this uh, environment of fear, right? So it really is um, kind of, again, creating more issues than it is solving. Um, and then also, you know, it's increasing the population of these private uh, prisons that hold these folks before uh, they are deported, um, which, you know, we get profit from. So... Yeah, so if you look at the, the meta problem of the of the immigration issue, uh, I guess what we're saying is, you know, if you look at that as a as a weight on our society, economically or however, you know, it's it's uh, this doesn't solve those problems. It doesn't address those problems. It, as Hannah says, creates it creates more problems. And so you're taking productive members of the community, uh, understood, they're here illegally, undocumented, but uh, you're taking productive members of the community out. Uh, it's a, it, So there are many more issues, and uh, I think that you're both right to point out that the, the conjunction of local authorities and federal authorities has always been something that's been very important to this whole issue, mm -hmm. and it seems as though that's breaking down a bit as well. Yeah, and uh, you're right. I mean, that, that this is almost sending, like, the wrong message. Like, this kid is going to school, and he's doing exactly what we want people who come to this country to do, is to have education and be, you know, great uh, contributors to society. And so it is not even, it's actually being a detriment to the problems that we want to fix uh, in our country, and especially uh, people who are against 
I guess, immigration at all. Um, so it's a, it's a detriment to that, to take a kid out of school who could provide some sort of benefit to society. And they typically do. But, um, yeah. Like, Im- undocumented immigrants bolster our economy. Like, all of them, right? So, I mean, you know, outside of the, the criminal population, that tends to be uh, the focus of uh, this legislation. Let's try to have a productive economy without immigrants. And let's, let's look at how many visas are provided by the U.S., right? And then look at that in relation to the revenue that is generated via taxes and mm. via um, just the labor force that undocumented immigrants provide. So if you are on the side of like uh, uh, being undocumented is criminal, then you need to take a deeper look, a critical look at how our economy functions. Yeah. No, you make a really good point. I think one of the like co-founders of Google was an immigrant. Like there's so many different people who have contributed so greatly to our society that were immigrants. And then if we treat them like this, we're going to lose a, a huge positive. Well, by the way, now I'm sorry, but and I know we're going to move on, but I have to just quickly uh, shoehorn this in. Economically, if you just want to talk the economics of it, mm-hmm. illegal immigrants, undocumented immigrants are the backbone of so many businesses mm-hmm. and they, they work in the shadows, they work in the in the kitchens, they work uh, in the fields. And now, just as a result of sort of the advertising that we're going to be tough on immigrants mm-hmm. in this country who are here in an undocumented way, there's a, been a chilling effect and they're having mm-hmm. trouble get staffing up those areas of the economy that depended. Again, this is sort of that you want to look at as sort of the gray economy. That's this undocumented yeah. population. Mm-hmm. So this country faces some issues in specific ways as a result of this policy and all of a sudden shaking the trees the way we are. Yeah. yeah. No, you make a really, really good point. We're moving on. Uber has been under fire quite a bit recently when it comes to harassment, bullying, and discrimination. But today, the company announced that they were actually they are actually going to be adopting some cultural changes and maybe even saying goodbye to their CEO Travis Kalanick. Now, a spokesman confirmed that the board met with former Attorney General Eric Holder and Tammy Alvaron, both partners with Covington and Burling, which is a law firm that was hired to investigate complaints of widespread sexual harassment and other deep-seated cultural problems at Uber. Now, board members voted unanimously to adopt all of the firm's recommendations. Um, now, let's. I just want to take a, a trip down memory lane of some of the controversies that Uber has been dealing with. Uh, back in February, former Uber engineer Susan Fowler wrote on a blog, she wrote a Medium article, uh, that she had been propositioned by her boss in a series of messages on her first day of work and that superiors ignored her complaints. If you have not read this media and PCA, you should go back and read it. It is such a great explanation of how sexual harassment works in the workplace, how awfully uh, some HR people respond. She also talks about some of the more seemingly innocuous uh, types of sexism that can happen happen in the workplace, like some of the rewards were only given to males because they didn't want to, there were only a few females and they couldn't make female sizes for them. There was all these crazy, crazy things that happened at Uber. So you should really read this. Uh, now, as a result of some of the sexual harassment complaints that they get, because she was not the only one, a lot of people came out following that post. Um, Uber announced last week that it fired 20 employees for harassment problems after a separate investigation by a different law firm. Um, It also fired a separate executive who obtained medical records of a woman who accused her Uber driver in India of raping her. And then he shared those medical records with other executives, including Klanik, who believed that the rape victim was making her story up as a way to discredit Uber in the Indian marketplace. So if that doesn't give you an idea of what this culture is like, I don't know what will. Uh, Further, CEO Klanik has had some issues of himself. I'm sure you remember the viral video of him yelling uh, at an Uber driver who was complaining about pay uh, and he basically said like some people just want to blame their shit on others and they don't take accountability which was a uh, lovely moment um, and some of uh, some other insights into his personality can be seen from a 2014 email that he sent out to uh, employees during the retreat in Miami it read do not have sex with another employee unless a you have asked that person for that privilege and they have responded with an emphatic yes I will have sex with you alright consent I'm into that uh, B, the two or more of you who do not uh, do not work in the same chain of command. Then he says, yes, that means that Travis will be celibate on this trip. 
hashtag CEO life, hashtag FML. Uh, there were also other references to drug use on the trip, uh, a puke charge, not throwing kegs off of buildings. So clearly Uber has a culture problem. They're working to fix that. The board has approved the changes that the law firm uh, recommended. There's no word whether or not uh, Kalanick will be leaving. He talked about before all of this happened that he might uh, consider taking a leave of absence. His mother uh, recently passed, so he might want to take leave of absence there. I think there's some other reasons that he might uh, consider taking a leave of absence. Uh, what do you guys think about this? It's interesting to me. How long has Uber been around? Like, how many? Not very. Not very long. Yeah, back in 2014, they only had 400 employees, and now they have nearly 9,000 workers. Right, so a couple of years. How do you already have deep-seated cultural issues? <laughs> so, right, so when we talk about places like Fox News, we, we tend to blame um, the issues of sexual harassment on these kind of uh, cultural norms that are entrenched in a particular generation of sexism, right? But with Uber, we see that, like, sexism is not a generational issue. Like, it's a cultural problem. Yeah, but we, I mean, like, whatever. They were around for a few years. I mean, we can't, I think, like, you were on Silicon Valley. Like, you know that that is a huge problem with these Silicon Valley tech problems. Like, I, it doesn't surprise me that they have huge cultural issues because a lot of these tech companies do. The point is that's also that you, you were mentioning Fox News. You are saying, hey, those old guys, that's kind of the way they used to do business in the 50s and 60s mm, or whatever. No, no, I'm saying that we cannot blame uh, the issues of sexual harassment on these this generational yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. trend that no, it is that. through and through. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right? It's no, through and through. That. They've been around for five years yeah. and we've got issues with sexism. Right? Yeah. So when we talk about sexual harassment in the workplace, let's put the blame on sexism and misogyny, not on generational norms or uh, certain, you know, certain yeah. issues that we try to shift the blame. I, so think, I, think, I think the problem is, is, I agree with you, it is completely through and through, but I think the problem is, is that we're in the year 2000 and 17 and we have all these laws now and all of these different uh infrastructure things that are in place to prevent this and we know we know better now even though we should have known better then um and so the fact that this still this shit is still happening um is messed up i'm glad they're trying to fix it by changing the culture i hope they get a new ceo who uh takes prioritize these things a little better all right guys that is it for this show we will see you guys later Bye bye, bye.